Hey, this is Jacob. We're on the ML Ops Community Podcast, aka the best podcast in the world. And today we're talking about a blog post that I wrote. I promise you, I'm not in an asylum right now, <laughs> although the walls <laughs> do look padded. <laughs> We finally got rid of Demetrius. So we put yep. him where he where he needed to be. <laughs> they still let me podcast out of here, though. That's the worst <laughs> thing that happened. Uh, so, no, I'm I'm in Portugal right now. We're about to do an in person meetup, which is awesome. I got to go run and get the pizzas for the actual event. Uh, but we just got done with this podcast with Jacob, my fellow Greek brother, who is he wrote the blog with a few of his teammates and he created the system around uber's exactly once real time um processing engine or processing with apache flink kafka and pnot we also just put out a video that is like an animation video on that whole thing that was us trying to synthesize all of that blog post and data but we um i mean it was cool man it was really it was really cool. The guy's freaking awesome. The guy was like, there were so many takeaways. I want to hear yours first, though. Give me, give yeah. it to me, and then I'll, I'll play off of yours. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that, I mean, his, first off, I think it's super cool to meet an engineer who's, who's also, a, you know, runs a very successful band, which is, which is awesome. Just people from all walks of life, which is great. But I mean, the system, right, that he built is, I mean, you know, as an engineer, that's an incredibly complex system that they put together. And at the scale that they're dealing with, you know, at Uber processing all of their event, ad events in near real time. I mean, that's incredibly impressive. Um, and I just thought it was like really cool to hear sort of how much they were able to rely on open source as like the core piece underlying everything, right? That they were using mm. Link and Kafka and, and Pinot and just all these things, these, these pieces of software that are fundamentally run by volunteers around the world but they're powering you know this massive organization's entire event processing pipelines uh, which mm -hmm. is which is a testament to, i think the power of open source um, so i think that was one really really cool thing to see and then the other thing i liked was just you know in ml we think a lot about this new trend of of real-time systems yes. and how they're up and coming and i think it was just great to hear him talk through the importance of really just keeping the customer in the loop, right? And just understanding what value is being derived from the real-time systems. Yeah. And why are we building the real-time? Why is it real-time in the first place? Why can't we just rely on batch? And being very proactive about those considerations from the get-go. It was so true how he was focusing so much. And he said it probably three times throughout the interview. Like, who are my customers? Who am I building this for? And is real-time necessary for them? That was his big question that he went through. I loved when I asked him the question about, let's imagine that you're getting pressure from your boss. You've never built any real-time system and your boss is telling you, you need to go out there and build it. Would you like run away from that company and get a new job where you can do your data science stuff or would you uh, sit through it? How do you look at that? And he was like, well, if it was me, I'd just go out and learn it and build it. And it was like a, a bit of a mic drop moment. Like, oh, damn. He was like, that's what I did with this. <laughs> so that was so cool to see. I, I don't want to give too much away. Let's get into it. Everyone, if you are enjoying these podcasts, please give us a like and subscribe. That would mean the world to us. You can also review the podcast and you can get bell notifications going out there to stay up to date on all of our most recent podcast and that's about all we got let's jump into this conversation man we're gonna start it off with your band and all those guitars in the background man let's just get it out because i i feel like that's where we have to start being a musician myself what's nice. the band you're in and how did it start give us a small little story around that yeah, uh, so I play in a band called Good Kid. I play lead guitar, and it started. Uh, we play like indie indie rock music, and it started in university. Actually, we were all studying. Not everyone was studying computer science at the time, but the majority of us uh, were doing computer science. 
um, our singer was like doing a bunch of stuff with AI. Um, our and then the rest of us are pretty much like mostly back end engineers. Um, and yeah, that's how we met. We decided to like we all were playing in bands our whole lives, and so we just started jamming one day, and then we were like, oh, this is great, and then we like added another guy, and then I got a guy for, who I worked with uh, like in a band from high school. And we brought him in, and then now he's a, he wasn't a programmer and he wasn't studying computer science, but now he is, uh, as a, pretty much as a result of being in this band. So it's kind of funny. <laughs> That's incredible. So, uh, do you write lyrics about being a software engineer, or is it more emotional, artisticy stuff? It's a mix. We have a song about like Donkey, well, kind of about Donkey Kong. We have a song about anime. Um, we write, we take inspiration from like whatever is around us or what we're consuming. Uh, definitely we take inspiration from like the art we're consuming. So whether that's like anime or a book or, or video games, or it could be like, you know, our own emotional experiences. Um, but yeah, it's great. We just finished a U.S. tour, um, and we're about to announce, uh, another one, uh, Ooh. actually today. Oh, so by the time this comes out, it will be live. We'll put a link to that in the description. Cool. Mikhail yeah. has a, a very interesting question for you in music and being a yeah. lead guitarist. I see it here in the doc that you <laughs> Maybe we want to start. With. Well, let's start with that one. Sure. Let's yeah, I mean, I, um, I mean, it, that's a fascinating background, honestly. Like, especially because like you, it seems like you're actually really quite successful with the music. You know, it seems like it's more than just a hobby. Mm. Um, I, I'm, I'm fascinated because we're you know here to talk about I guess music in some respect, but also this really fascinating real-time system that you built at Uber mm -hmm. previously. How do those connect? I mean, what is what have you maybe learned about real-time systems by being in a band and, and vice versa? Hmm. I don't know if I would say they connect in... Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little tough. I will say the, the skills that require to be like in a band of five people uh, where you have to work together over like a long period of time and across a variety of like different problems um, are very similar to, I would say like a team at a company, um, yes. you know, especially like a small team that you have to like kind of just like figure things out as you go along. Um, especially if you're doing like greenfield stuff, like the, the system that I built at uh, Uber, like we hadn't really built a system like that at the company before. Um, and a lot of those skill sets of like collaboration, working with people, uh, making sure people feel heard, all those things like are, I would say like definitely have a lot of overlap. And then in terms of like how the system I built helps the band, I wouldn't say there are, there isn't much overlap in terms of like real time systems, but it does give me a interesting understanding, uh, a much deeper understanding of how these systems work when it relates to something like Spotify, for example, it gives a bunch of stats yeah. to bands. If you're a spot, if you're an artist on Spotify, you have this like Spotify for artists page and they'll tell you all these things about like the performance of your songs and all these things. Oh. And I can tell you right now, that's not using a real-time system because it's all delayed and there's all these other things. So getting that kind of understanding helps me kind of evaluate some things. So we have a manager, for example, with the band, and he might say like, oh, we got a big bump in streams this day. And I'm like, well, actually, that happened two days ago. Or that probably mm -hmm. happened like a day ago because like clearly this is like a batch system, you know, and that kind of... It. So there are some like little nuances. And then if we're trying to figure out where that came from, if it came from like, I don't know, some uh, like we've gotten bigger in the streaming community, uh, like like Twitch and stuff. Um, if it came from a, a Twitch streamer using our music, it's it. We can now s narrow our search down to like the day before instead of looking, wasting our time looking for today. So there's some like weird, some weird, uh, some weird uh, nuances there that like benefit each other. I would say. I was hoping you were going to tell us how to game the Spotify algorithm because <laughs> no, I <laughs> I don't think there's any way to game any algorithm. I think it's uh, someone said this once. I can't remember who. Uh, and they said, like, anytime you say the word algorithm, you can probably replace it with, uh, with like, human psychology or something or, like, with the audience. Uh, and it really just is, like, if you make good things that people like, then, mm. then the algorithms will pick it up. It, so, it sounds like <laughs> one of the main wins I'm, I'm hearing, for, or at least from the real time to, to band, has been you're much more pedantic about the systems that you use to, to actually yeah. do your music. And now you're that guy who's always like, well, actually... That's not how that works. So, uh, yeah. you know, we should we should reconsider this. <laughs> well, we're, we're, very, we're obviously a very data driven band because we're all programmers. So. So it's fun to be able to like geek out over all the like an, like analytics that all these platforms give you, not just like yeah. Spotify, but Apple Music or even like Twitter mm -hmm. and Instagram. They there's so much data that you get as a as someone on these platforms. Um, and so getting to like make sense of that in a way in a in a more nuanced way, I think, is um it's definitely like a good overlap, but it's, it's, I don't, I don't know if it's like too 
uh, too related. I'll say that. <laughs> Wait, but have you set up like uh, the mono, like a data stack for all of your analytics? Uh, no, but only because I tried. I did. I was like trying to work through all the different like APIs that all these uh, things provide, but. Uh, uh, but it was honestly just became like a big pain and there's like there's services that do that for you for like 20 bucks a month it, it, and at this yeah. point i was like okay i have other things i want to like I, <laughs> if i could write a song instead of spending my time doing this or even like i built a video game for the band and i think that would be a better use of my time than making rebuilding something that exists for like a reasonable price oh that's so good that is so cool yeah. so hey, Demetrius, are you trying to were you trying to get at like a money ball type of approach to yep. uh to you know <laughs> literally <laughs> game the algorithm figure out a way to do that that's what i was hoping for i mean i've got my songs on spotify and what happened w was really weird because i just put them out there and all of a sudden well, well i forgot about them for probably like three or four or five months after we like released our our cd and this was in 2015 and then I went on and I figured out, oh, I can see analytics and I can see how my music is doing. We released it with um, CD Baby. And mm -hmm. so you could see, like, they give you a dashboard of, oh, on Apple Music, it's like this. On Spotify, it's like this. And so one day I went and I looked at the dashboard and I realized we randomly just got a bunch of traffic. And mm. it was like, I, you know no matter what we were doing on social media, it had no effect on our streams. Like we could try and pump something up and push like a new song. It wouldn't matter on Spotify. There was no correlation. And so I realized mm -hmm. that all these people that are listening to us on Spotify, they have no idea. Like they don't follow us on social media. Like they just randomly encountered our music and then they put us on some playlist or something and there we stand. And so out of nowhere we have a lot of uh streamers from mexico and brazil nice <laughs> those cool. are the two it's just so random and so that's why i was wondering like hmm maybe if you've got some secrets i could get into that would be I think what i, I want to know but, but this is what i was kind of saying like i think it just means that people in those areas like vibe with your music i don't know whether it's the type of music or or the yeah. style or, or or whatever but uh that's probably what it means like same same thing happened to us our first song we put out and it wasn't, I think it was like a month after we put it out on Spotify, it got on like some playlist and, or then it got on like Discover Weekly. And then yeah. again, I think the algorithm, the way the algorithm works with the, that stuff is like, you know, if it gets on someone's Discover Weekly and enough people like it, or they listen to the whole thing, then it's going to get on more people's Discover Weekly. And it's, yes. this is why I say like, I don't know if there's a way to game an algorithm other than just keep putting out good quality stuff. And then I think yeah. I, like, or things that. Yeah, I don't know. That, that's kind of at least how I see it is. Not saying that our music is better quality than other people's who aren't getting that traction. Um, mm. But I do think like, you know, we do put a lot of attention and care into making sure even just like the production value is good. Um, or mm. like our big decision when we started out was we were, we had enough money to either do like one song well, like professionally, or do like five songs at like a crappy studio. And we decided to do one song. Like we put all our money together into one song uh, back when we had like no money or we were in like university. Um, and then it, it worked, it kind of worked out. It's incredible, man. So yeah. let's jump into, I'm sure there's a lot of people that came here and they were not expecting to get this deep dive on yeah. music and the algorithm, the Spotify way to do things. Let's jump into this, uh, Uber blog that you wrote. You've since moved yeah. on from Uber, but I think it is an incredible blog post that you and, Thanks. and a few others wrote, mm -hmm. um, I want to just go into something like maybe we should talk first about the story of how this all came to be, like how I reached out to you. I told you we've got this video that we're producing. We're trying to mm. base it on your blog post. And then you were kind enough to look over it and you realized that we had it all wrong. So, <laughs> so we had to edit it. We had to change everything around. And now hopefully it is right. It's it's coming out this Thursday, which is uh, probably by the time this podcast comes out, will be last Thursday. Uh, mm -hmm. But let's just talk a little bit about the bigger picture of what you all were trying to do, the system that you built, and then we can dive into specifics. Yeah, for sure. Um, so when I joined Uber, um, the Toronto office like pretty much didn't exist, at least not for engineering. Um, and so I was one of the founding members of the Toronto office. And um, as part of that founding team, we 
they Uber made an interesting decision, which I thought was cool, was which was to give like the Toronto office a greenfield project, um, to be like, hey, like you know, this is not an exit. We don't want to start the office with like existing projects that have like a lot of tech debt or a lot of like baggage or whatever. We want to do like something completely new. That actually wasn't ads. That was like another. That was we were building a like we were supposed to build grocery. Then they acquired a company. Uh, it got we got pivoted over to ads, which was another. Luckily, like we had a really amazing director, uh, this guy Nick Petty, and he fought for the Toronto office. Like, if if we were gonna lose grocery, he was like, we want to be the team that builds ads at at uh, at Uber, and so that's kind of it. Like, we were a very small, scrappy team. There's a lot of work to do. Um, honestly, like the fact, even the fact that I got to build this system was pretty rare, and I think lucky for the level I was at. I was a L four at Uber at the time when I was like starting this project since like and through this project it like helped me get promoted to senior but uh the scope and like um responsibility of this system for an l4 is i think pretty pretty rare um but yeah in general uh there's like multiple aspects of an ad system um you need you need like a ad auction you need like a surface to to display it you need a, a place for like bidding um you need to bill uh bill merchants uh, or like bill advertisers um, and then you would need a way to like process all the events that get generated through ads uh, to like make it all work. And so this system that we're going to talk about, or the one that I wrote the blog post about, is that like real time, exactly once um, ad event processing system. Perfect. So, where did we mess up when we sent you the video? <laughs> oh, I don't remember exactly. I, it's not that. Look, it's a pretty complex system. I'll say that. Like, and there's a lot of pieces that. Um, can seemingly be convoluted if you don't like have a, a deeper understanding of like Uber infrastructure. Uh, I think you guys just like misinterpreted what exactly once meant or where where it where it was being used, um, which is totally understandable because if you look at the diagram, it kind of looks like a big like spider web or something. Um, I, mean, I think it, it it is it's a very complex system, and I can see how it'd be like really difficult to to build this. So it's super impressive that you guys put this together. Um, yeah. I guess one of the things that you talked about in your blog post was these like three different factors you were trying to get right in, mm. in terms of the system, right? Kind of speed, reliability, and, and accuracy, right? Were the, were the three things yeah. that you had put great emphasis on. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about each of those considerations and what, why each of them was important and how you, how you emphasize them and maybe what were some of the trade-offs as you were going around building the system with regards to each of those. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, in general, like this is this system is responsible for processing all the events that get generated from ads, um, and it has a lot of dependencies. Like our, if you if the way I like to think about a system sometimes is starting like, okay, who are our clients? The clients of this system are data scientists, engineers, um, ops people who are like running reports for for like McDonald. Like you know, I don't I don't know if it's McDonald specifically, but if a big client is on Uber Eats running ads. They're not looking at their dashboard. They have some manual contact who is doing it for them. Um, other like just manual, like automated systems, like a billing system, for example, is a client. Um, and then the advertisers themselves, like they get a dashboard of like the performance of their ads. So it's a lot, it's like pretty much everyone is our client. Um, and uh, and so, so different clients have different needs. Data scientists probably don't need the speed requirement, for example, like they can run their, their reports with some delay, they usually do anyway. Um, but, but billing, for example, as like a system that needs to know how many ads did we show, that needs to be fast. Or pace. I mean, maybe even billing doesn't necessarily need to be fast, but uh, something like pacing or um, updating budgets, so we know how much a user has spent. Because we don't know how much someone has spent until we get like a. Because we only charge. Uh, you don't charge people for how many ads were shown. Well, at least. The way that Uber did it, it's based on how many people clicked on the ad. So you need that actual feedback, right? And so you can imagine a world where like someone puts out an ad, they have a hundred dollar budget, um, and and they spent ten bucks in their first day, and you maybe want to pace it over like a whole week. So you want to stop showing ads, but you need that feedback. You need that feedback quickly because if you don't get it, you're just going to keep showing ads over and over. And you're going to run out of the budget like pretty much immediately. So when we talk about like the different requirements, it's not that like. The, I would say like the requirements, a lot of them come out, come from having that many clients and trying to balance like the mm -hmm. needs of all of them or trying to make sure that they all get the needs that they have. So speed was a big one for there, um, mostly for the, the downstream like automated systems like pacing and budget updates. Um, 
it also has the extra, but like, and some of them just give extra benefits, right? Like if it's fast, then users get to see updated metrics immediately instead of like what we were talking about earlier with Spotify, where I know for a fact that like the, my Spotify metrics are at least a day old. Um, it'd be cool if I could see them in real time. Right. And so that's mm -hmm. what we just, we get to make a better ads product and one that's actually kind of unique. Cause I, I th don't think a lot of ad systems use that for reporting. So that's speed, um, reliability. Uh, I think that one's just kind of like standard, like, um, the system deals with money and anything that deals with money and like performance of, of like, and directly like discussing, um, uh, like performance of, uh, ads for customers. So we deal with like customer data and we deal with money. It's gotta be reliable. Um, it's pretty much like non-negotiable. Um, and then accuracy, it's kind of on a similar vein where, um, you know, we, again, we're dealing with, with financial, uh, data. So if it's not accurate, it means that we're either going to overcharge or undercharge merchants. Both are bad. Undercharging, Uber loses money. Overcharging, we lose customer trust, all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So that's kind of where those requirements come out. Um, typically, it's hard to get all three, especially reliability and accuracy, like at the same time. Um, and there, are, so it's not that we we didn't really make trade offs, to be honest. Like, uh, mm -hmm. like there are there are trade offs to make sometimes, but we decided to try. To, like the goal of this system is to build something with, without having to make those trade-offs. The trade-offs typically came in like extra work, <laughs> you know, or came in like having to, to set up things in a way that was more complicated. Um, so that, that's why I would say like the trade-offs are. So there, that was kind of my, my next question was going to be like, what were some of the biggest trade-offs? But it sounds like you just made sure to say these three things are the most important to us. So we're going to pound the pavement until we get them right. What were some of the challenges that you encountered as you were going through that journey? Yeah, I mean, so, so like one, uh, I guess like what we say, no trade-offs, I guess the trade-off is complexity, right? Like the system is a lot more complex than like what you could have done. We could have also just, if we didn't have speed as a requirement, for example, we could have just made a batch system. That's pretty easy to get reliable and, uh, and uh and accurate right like uh that that's like not that hard and you have then you just have that like one day delay of typical things like you ingest data it goes to some data warehouse once it's there you run some like spark job or query that that like that's a pretty standard practice within the industry um and then you're getting your like accuracy and your reliability through that unless like assuming that your job infrastructure works and doesn't like fail randomly um but anyway so the trade-offs we have was like the complexity of this system um and I would say like some of the some of the more interesting pieces are actually like limitations of Uber's infrastructure, not necessarily like. And I think that's where the miscommunication came when when you guys were looking at the blog. Um, sorry, I, I think I misunderstood the question a little bit. Could you could you repeat it? Yeah, it was it was around more of the challenges, like what some of the yeah. hardest parts for you had been. Wh mm -hmm. When did you run into walls? What were some obstacles? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, reliability was like one of the hardest parts. Uh, yeah. Sorry, not reliability. Accuracy was one of the hardest parts. Actually, depending on the time of the project, different pieces were harder. At the beginning, accuracy was really hard, and that's because we were that, and that's what motivated a lot of this exactly one step work that we did. Um, but it wasn't so easy because like no no team at Uber had done exactly once before. So we had to like enable it in the Kafka topics, in the Flink jobs. It's not that hard. Like they're usually just like configuration changes. Um, but this is kind of what I'm saying about like having a deeper understanding of Uber infrastructure. I, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly at the time, like we couldn't enable it in certain types of Kafka topics. So like yeah. Uber has a concept of like local topics and aggregate topics. Um, and the aggregate topics, which is like, you know, if Uber's a distributed system across different regions, which it is for like a whole bunch of reasons, um, you know, messages will first go into like the local topic. So if something's in like the East of the States, it'll go there for like, if it got generated in the East and similarly for the West. And then we have this concept of aggregate topics, which aggregates the data between those, the, the localized ones. So it would have been a lot easier if we could have put like an exactly one thing on the, on the aggregated topics, because then we have all the data. Um, but that was like a limitation of Uber's infrastructure. We couldn't do that. So we had to do it on all the local ones, which means that we had to do a whole bunch of like extra, extra work. Um, like we have a final job that literally syncs from the both regions. Like it, we have a Flink job that that's pretty much its entire job is to sync data from, from two different regions. Those are some of like the, the complexities there. Um, then just some other complexities with being the first team to do this. So, you know, 
things are never as advertised, especially when you're working at a big company. So a team might say like, oh, this works. And then you find out it doesn't actually work. So one of our like downstream uh, dependencies, uh, which was Pinot, um, had this feature upsert that we were really leveraging. And it's not that the upsert feature didn't work, but working with the Kafka team, like the, it, it all kind of, again, it's, <laughs> this is getting down to the nitty gritty gritty details but it all kind of depended on the on the ingester to kafka because the upstart feature depends on every message of the same with the same primary key goes into the same uh kafka partition so the kafka partitioner that is used has to make sure that 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 is true and so we had like many times back and forth where like the partitioner that that was being used at uber just like wasn't doing it properly um and therefore like the the feature wasn't working as expected. So when I did inspect my data, I saw it's like a ton of duplicates. And I was like, why are we getting all this duplicate data? This doesn't make any sense. Uh, and through looking through it, like going in, we had to like go in and literally change like the partitioner logic and stuff like that. So a lot of the complexities come actually from working really closely with the infrastructure teams um, and the data platform team at Uber. And just like, yeah, trying to understand probably more than I any, any backend engineer probably usually understands of, of like, how exactly everything is working uh, at Uber. I think that, I mean, one of the design considerations that seemed to be pretty important in the system overall, which I think you alluded to a little bit, was this exactly once semantics, right? The idea that the yeah. events should only be processed a single time. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about why that was so crucial to the system as it was built? Yeah. Um, and I'll say that it's like not exactly exactly once. Like there are pieces that are that are using exactly once semantics across like certain jobs, um, and there's others that kind of fake it, um, <laughs> or not fake it, but like it, you still get the result. Like I was mentioning, like Pino uses an upsert feature, so even if we do duplicate it, we're never going to write to the database twice. Um, but for example, like well, um, the Hive table that we use, or like our data warehouse, there's no way for us to like deduplicate on writing. So we du duplicate on the query on the query side. So we know like anyone who's querying that data knows to like use a use a primary key as as a deduplication key when they're uh, or as like an item potency key or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. um, so so exactly once uh, was crucial, mostly for the reliability and the and the the mm -hmm. accuracy. Um, like Flink jobs do go down for a variety of reasons all the time. Like this whole system is built off the back of Flink, right? And it, things happen, um, you might run out of memory, I don't know, something, like there's a million reasons for why a Flink job could, could go down. Um, and when that happens, it restarts. And when it restarts, it's going to reprocess all the events from like the previous checkpoint from, from when it like last saved its, its state. Um, and if it reprocesses out events, then you're going to overcharge merchants. It's like yeah. the same, it's all the same idea. So that's where exactly once comes in. It's just like, it really helps with that. It gives you those accuracy guarantees that you need. Um, mm -hmm. and also gives you some security when things go wrong that you're not gonna, you're not, it's, it's not like it's tied necessarily to reliability. Like it doesn't make your systems more, like it doesn't keep them up longer or keep them up in a more, um, robust way. But when they do, when bad things do happen, you do have that confidence to know like, okay, we're not, at least we, we're, we're not going to reprocess everything. Um, so it gives you that like kind of peace of mind. Yeah. One of the, um, I mean, you mentioned it's not exactly, exactly once. And I, th I thought that was really funny because it feels like you, the title of the blog post is real time system, but even in like the mm -hmm. first paragraph you say, it's like not exactly real time. That kind of makes it, me think, like, yeah. It, it is real time. It's just that like we, we put a delay, but like it is all, like mm -hmm. it's still technically real time. It's just like, we have a specific delay because when you're building these systems, you can specify like checkpoint intervals and you can specify cool. uh, like what, what your window of, so like. Is it not real time if I say like our window length of like grabbing events is one minute? Like I would say, I would argue it's still real time. Even if that window was like 20 minutes, I would say it's still real time um, because yes. the processing is all happening in real time, you know? Um, but yes. but it's not like instant. I guess maybe I should have worded it better. I should have said like, it's not instantaneous, you know? That that might've been a, a better wording. Well, no, but I, I think, I mean, what you get at is, is this like interesting nuance, right? Which is that real time is kind of this catch-all term. And actually it seems like, if you really dig into what it means, there's actually a lot of different, there's gradations of real time, right? Yeah, it's yeah. not just like, oh, literally instantaneous versus a batch. It takes a day to process, right? Actually, there's yeah. this whole spectrum that you can you, you can live on. And, and that's maybe, so, you know, in a sense, your system is still real time by some definition of the word. It just may not be yeah. like microsecond real time or something. Like yeah, that. it's, yeah, it's more about like the, the way the system operates rather than, rather than, uh, 
the time it takes in general. I mean, because even batch, like batch, you can do it with like real time jobs. But like, what, what really I think batch gets maybe I'm someone will <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but my interpretation of like how batch or like the ethos of batch is that you know you have data going into some data warehouse or some some database storage for like at some period of time, then you you create a cutoff and you say like okay at this now we're gonna process x information within like these bounds and mm -hmm. in the real-time system that doesn't really happen you're just as as it's coming in you're processing it and that's kind of how i'm that's kind of how i understand the different the main difference if i were to think between the two of them yeah i mean some people even say that batch is like a, i think a special case of, of real time in a sense. yeah uh, so all right let's keep it moving one thing that i also constantly think about and especially when we're looking at this system and you built it from the ground up what were some of those main, because this is <laughs> any engineer who's coming in to uh, an Uber or a Google or Amazon or whatever, they get those interview questions like, all right, so build me this system. And so how did it actually look when you were building the system? What were some of the main questions that you were asking? Was it around and how did you land on these? I guess you kind of talked about that already, how you landed on these three pillars. Uh, but what, <laughs> what questions were were there that made you think, all right, this is how we're going to choose these design decisions? Like you said, let's go with mm -hmm. Kafka and uh, uh, Flink. Was that because yeah. Uber's already using that? Is everything already there in a way you had to kind of piggyback on what was there? Like, what does <laughs> that look like? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question. Um, if I'm thinking about it, I think a lot of it, like I said, goes back to who your customers are or who your dependency, who your clients are, who's dependent on your system. Um, and that's typically how I approach any sort of like design or project is I think like who, who, who needs this in like whatever, whatever it is, and then try to work back the requirements from there. Um, our team was really strapped. We did like, typically I would imagine that's the job of like a product manager. Um, but you know, we didn't have one. So, uh, so you kind of have to do it yourself, but even if you have one, it's still a good idea to do it as an engineer, because like when this is very much like the, there's one client is like an actual customer of as the, all the other ones are either engineers or systems, right? Like those are my clients. So like, I don't even know if a product manager would have called that stuff out. Um, so I, I usually start going there and then working my way back. And then once I know like, okay, what are, what, what does the system need to do? Uh, then I start thinking, okay, like, what is the best way to do that? And sometimes those decisions can, like, especially at a big company can be made for you. Something like Kafka, like Uber is one of the biggest deployments of Kafka in the world. You're not going to use anything else for message queues. Like you, you could, if you really, really pushed and fought for it, but it would be ridiculous. Like I would, it would be the wrong decision 99% of the time, all of our tooling, all of our, like, it's so easy at Uber. It takes like clicks to set up a Kafka topic and then have all data that writes to it, go to a data warehouse, for example. And they have like good ingestors set up from like Kafka to Pino or other like, di like data databases and stuff like that. So in general, like you would have to be a, you'd have to have like the best reason in the world to not use some of these things. Um, that said, you know, decision to use Pino that wasn't made for me, the decision to use Flink, not necessarily made for me. There's other options there. Um, I had a bit of experience at, with Flink because the project I worked on previously, uh, for grocery was search ingestion. So I built out, I was like, I was responsible for ingesting all of our data from like the grocery stores into a search index so that we could use it like essentially just for search on, on the app. Um, and I was using Flink for that. So I had some experience with it. That was the first time I had used Flink at the time. Um, so I had some experience with that. Um, and so for me, it's, it was a mix. The questions I was asking was kind of like, yeah, like what do our customers need? Um, what is the, what are the best ways to do that? What are the best technologies that I have available, uh, to do them and then like doing an analysis of them. So even for Pino, I think it was like a decision between like Pino, Druid, ClickHouse, like there's multiple versions of those same technologies. Um, and for Flink, you know, there's Flink, there's Kafka streams, there's Spark, um, there's, there's other things you can, you can use. Um, but at the end of the day, like once you land on like, okay, this system needs to be real time. Okay. We, we need some real time stream streaming framework. Right. Um, those are, that's when, those are the questions that you like, I don't know, to me, it gets kind of simple and gets easier once you understand fully, like what the, what the problem is. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, I mean, I think one of the most amazing things about the system is it seems like the whole thing is fundamentally built on open source, right? The whole, the whole system as a whole is, is this testament to just OSS. Yeah. And I mean, I wonder, you know, to what extent, uh, 
you know, what do you think that says about just like the state of OSS and uh, the fact that there's a, these systems are so robust that you can build literally, you know, one of the largest companies' entire ad event processing infrastructure on top of it, and it seems yeah. to be resilient enough to do that, right? Yeah, um, I mean, it's amazing. Like, it's uh, I know Uber as a company really, really cares about that, and like the people who work there, especially on those teams, that they it's like fundamental to them. So, like we mentioned, we we're talking about that upsert feature that was contributed by an Uber engineer to Pino. Um, and we got to use it immediately, right? So it's like mutually beneficial, of course. Like the whole world now gets to use this. Anyone who's using Pino, I guess, not the whole world, but anyone who's using Pino gets to use this upsert feature. And now I also get to use it as an engineer at Uber. Um, and I got to work really closely with that engineer. He's amazing. Stefan, I think he got promoted recently, but senior staff engineer, Yu Peng, really, really, he's one of the co-authors. Like he wrote the blurb on, on upsert. Um, and He's incredible. He's writing like he, he publishes blogs all the time. He contributes to open source. He's like a big advocate for this stuff. Um, I think it says a lot about the state of open source because like these tools can be leveraged by massive companies, but it also says something about like the kinds of companies that give back because a lot don't, you know, like Amazon doesn't contribute crap <laughs> to open source. Uh, they just they just write a wrapper around it and, it's changing. and sell it. I do you want maybe. to say it is changing? It's an ongoing sure. process. It's changing. Yeah, maybe, but in general, like their mo is to actually like steal open source essentially and and put a wrapper yeah. around and sell it back to people, right? <laughs> like it's it's actually a much more uh, it they just consume 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 from it without giving nearly as much back as they're consuming and as much as they're benefiting. Um, and then Uber is a good example of a company that like they leverage open source, like incredible. Like we said, like all this whole thing is built off the back of open source, but they give so much back to it. Like, you know, they give back updates for Kafka, they give back updates for Pinot, for Flink. Like they are, they are part of the ecosystem. And I, I think that's a very powerful combination when you have, mm -hmm. when you have the, it can't, I guess I was saying it can be like a good marriage of the two. Um, and when I, when it is, it's really awesome. And this is my first experience of it, to be honest. Like I had never worked at a place that like contributed so much back to open source and where it was such a big, big piece of it. Um, yeah. All right. So I've got one here that I wanted to ask that I think is, is interesting. And it's, um, when it comes to real time processing systems for analytical use cases, such as like mm -hmm. data scientists analyzing data in a hive database, how important are having real time systems for predictive use cases as well? Um, Interesting. Like, I mean, I think it, de it, it kind of depends on like every <laughs> answer to anything. It depends on, on what the system is, like what, what you're trying to predict, um, and how that changing data affects the prediction. So previously before I worked at Uber, I actually worked at a company called Shopify and we were working on a recommendation system for, um, for marketing for merchants to be like, Hey, you should run like an ad campaign for this because I don't know, we have like some model that tells us like a product you sell is trending or something right now. Um, now the, I, I guess the question I would ask for that is like, you know, if new product data coming in at the like millisecond changes the outcome of like that recommendation, then it's pretty important, but it probably doesn't in those cases. Like, like I'm sure there are some use cases we could think about where like, Every, maybe like, I don't know, trading, if you're building trading software and like the, the ins and outs of like each individual trade could change the prediction of like a move you should make if you're trying to make a predictive, a predictive trading software or something like that, I could see something like that being really important. Um, but I think a large amount of use cases for these types of predictive systems probably don't care about like the individual event uh, coming in, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's, it's kind of an interesting idea because, you know, a lot of our listeners are MLOps practitioners, people that some do build purely analytical systems as mm -hmm. data scientists, but many of them do tend to build machine learning systems that are predicted by nature. So there is this question around, yeah, broadly there's a trend maybe towards more real-time systems, but are they really necessary today for like a small organization? Like maybe for yeah. Uber, having a real-time system is crucial for a lot of these downstream use cases, but you know, does an organization that's maybe smaller and smaller in stature earlier on in its, in its life cycle with regards to analytical and predictive use cases, do they still have value for something that's near real time, you know? And, and I yeah. wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, that's, I mean, I've, I've actually talked a lot about this and I've thought a lot about it. 
uh, again, I just think it depends on your product. Like, what are you building? What what value are you getting out of that real time? Like I said, for us, like most ad systems are not real time. Even a lot of what I did when I was building out the system is that I would go use. I you know, luckily because I play in Good Kid, I had an excuse to run ads to tr test out what other systems did, and I went through their like analytics. Most of them are not giving you real time feedback on like the performance of the ad, and. I understand why like most advertisers probably aren't sitting there like clicking refresh on their dashboard to see like how their their campaign is performing that said you know if you did have access i don't know it's, it could be like a chicken and egg thing right like the more real-time data you have maybe the more ideas you can come up with for products built on top of that for example like if an ad could you interject midway through an ad because you know it's not performing as well as another ad that you just ran and maybe you could you could give a notification to your advertiser be like yo this is not working. Like you know, the last one you did was is way better than this one. I've given the same point life cycle within its within its run. You should change something about it. Change the title. Change the the description. Change the picture. Like you know, it's not to say that there aren't things to do it to to build off of, um, but it's it's a bit of a check in the egg. You're probably not going to think of those use cases unless you have the data to like action on. Um, so so uh, yeah, like I said, it's tough. I'm sure that like I said, I think the majority of the use cases probably don't need it, um, but it's not to say that if you had it, you couldn't figure out cool ways to leverage it, you know? That's fascinating to me, like how it can open up new doors when you do have that potential and you can build new yeah. products on top of it. I think that's super cool to think about and just let the mind run wild. I actually yeah, could that be a different could that be a differentiator, right? Like if yeah. if in Uber's use case, like if DoorDash is running ads, which I'm sure they probably are at this point, you know, is are there ads in real time? Like I have no I I don't personally know, but like that could be a, one of the differentiators for a restaurant. Like, hey, I'd rather have like just small edges, right? Like that make you a, a different, like yep. better, better competitor. Yeah, it creates that moat for sure. Yeah. So there was actually this last week I was talking to a guy who's coming from, and <laughs> this is a little bit of the same question, but with a different spin in story form. So bear with me mm -hmm. here. The um, I was talking to this guy who just came into the community and he was coming from a data science background. He just mm. actually, he was coming from an electrical engineering background, got into data science. Mm. Now he's working at this FinTech as a data scientist, but they don't have anyone that actually productionizes the M ML systems. And so mm. he's starting to move more towards ML ops and mm. his boss is really on his case about how things need to be real time. And I was like, yeah. dude, try and stay away from it as much as possible for as long as you can because it adds so much more complexity and you coming for from sure. a data science background, all of a sudden having to set up a system that is for real time is not going to be the most fun thing in the world. If you're looking at that and you're having to coach someone through that or you're the boss there, again, I understand it depends and every use case is different. This use case was for fintech, so obviously I think there is a strong use case in most fintech. They they want things real time, probably for fraud detection. I would imagine. How are you looking at that? Is it like this guy needs to go running uh, from this company because, or he needs to try and get the uh, try and champion for someone to be brought on to his team that knows a little bit more about system design? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you think through that stuff? If it was me, I would probably just learn it and do it. That's that's how I would that's how I would approach it. Um, because that's kind of what I did here. Um, like I didn't, I had barely used. Like I said, I used Flink once before, but I barely used Flink. And I had to read it. I read an entire. I don't know if I have it, but I read an entire book on Flink to build this system. You know, like I don't think uh, I didn't have any experience with real time systems before I built one. Um, and even this version, like I built a shitty MVP uh, that I didn't write about, obviously, but. Uh, I built a really crappy MVP first, and then I rebuilt, got to rebuild it all from scratch, um, because like that's what it necessitated. Um, so, I, but all that said, big obvious caveat is like, is he in the environment with the people that will allow him to like learn while he builds it with the forgiveness, like when you do inevitably mess up because you are doing it for the first time, you know? And like, do, is that the space for him to be able to grow? If he's in that space, then I would say like, yeah, just learn it, learn it, and do it. I don't think there's anything that like. You can't really learn if you spend if you if you're motivated enough to do it. Um, it might just take more time because he hasn't done it. But if he's got that support, then like I think it'll it helps, right? You level up your career. Um, 
quite literally, but also like, you know, not, not, just, you don't have, I did personally get promoted off this project, but I didn't, even if I didn't, I would be so much better. Like in next, when we were talking about like interview questions, like next time I'm in an interview, I get to talk about this project. When I'm interviewing at companies, this is the project I talk about because it's the most complex, it's the most interesting. Um, and I think it's the most impressive thing I've ever worked on, even though like it's been a while since I've been there. Um, and it probably will be one of the more impressive projects I ever get to work on. If that, like, if I'm being completely honest, like I'm not sure I'll get to work on something this interesting for a while. Um, so, so I do think, uh, I, I would, that, that would be my advice to coach him. Like try to work with whoever his manager is, whoever's putting that pressure, try to get them to understand like these things take time, push back on it, try to get like timelines, like appropriately scoped. Um, and tell them like, and do, do enough research to understand like, this is what it's going to take to, to build this. If you really want it, like I need like six months, you know, and I need like two other people and this is like, then we can get it done. Like I didn't build this all by myself. Like one of the other authors, uh, or the two other authors on this were like backend engineers who I worked with like closely on this. Like, you know, uh, we had James Kwan who built out, he, he built out like a lot of the building infrastructure for ads. Um, but he, before he was on that, he was like working with me, built, working on these jobs and like figuring out this stuff. And Yuri, uh, Bondaruk is like an incredible engineer, um, on ads as well. And he, he did so much, so much work, um, around even just like helping with the consistency, um, of the system and the reliability of it. Yeah. I think that real time is an interesting thing in, in the ML community. Uh, and I also have kind of an anecdote that also, I think literally happened conversation that happened yesterday where. You know, nominally, I believe the future will be increasingly real time, right? That like it just mm -hmm. makes so much more sense. We don't yet know all the things that we can do, as you said, and in some sense, we need to get there to start enabling all these new use cases. And I think we will go there. I think it's it's generally reasonable to assume that more data, more you know systems that are more up to date, more quickly, more fresh, all will lead to better outcomes, and that seems pretty you know incontroversial. However. I also spoke to someone who, you know, was working on a company uh, where they were trying to basically help data scientists productionize their systems, mm. and they spent six months targeting the real-time use case, mm. and then after six months, they sort of pivoted away from that because they just weren't seeing enough. They weren't seeing enough examples of people solving those kinds of problems yeah. to build an entire company today around that. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Um, and since then, they've gone to more batch-based predictive. <laughs> Uh, productionizing of systems so um, you know it's, it's interesting sort of back and forth between is today when we need real time should we be thinking about building up that infrastructure today or is this a kind of more like a one to two year from now sort of a problem why this is kind of where like it's also a thing at scale like i even mentioned that when i was talking about my clients like the data scientists were not the ones who needed mm -hmm. real-time data it was like yeah. the billing systems it was the other systems and just because of the nature of the system and being like you know honestly like I could see a world where if this was a more mature team, like if it wasn't like, hey, we have one person to build this out. We have one person to build up. Like we literally had one guy <laughs> to do this system, which was me. We had one guy to do, like even though people worked on it, it's not, they were still working on their own things. Like the guy who was helping me was working on building up billing. And we had the other guy working on like pacing. Like essentially at one point when all was said and done, we had one person per core service. I could see a world where like, if I had more resources or a full team just for this aspect of it, maybe I would have broken this out and I would have said, you know what, like we don't need speed for data scientists. So they're going to just do like a batch for, for their stuff. We're only going to focus on like the real time aspect for billing. And that's gonna, not even going to be related to like reporting and the whole reporting chain for like analytics for customers will just all be batching will be delayed. And we'll only like, you know, this could be a lot more simplified if it's just for the billing use case, it could just be like one flick job that processes clicks and sends them to this billing like service, you know, that would, that would be pretty easy. Um, I think one of the things when like circumstantially, like being the only person working on this, to me, it seemed easier to do it all, all together than to break it out into multiple things yeah. with different like technologies that I'd have to learn, like many different technologies to do, to do what essentially was like processing of the events for ads where, where in my mind, it was easier to build out like one holistic view and it's not to say that this is like, you know, these Flink jobs live independently a lot of, in a lot of ways. So like it is still very extensible. If we need to add new use cases, we can easily add like new Flink jobs or whatever, or we can break them out. But um, I could see a world where I would not have made that decision if I had like way more resources and, and time. Huh. 
That's such a good answer. And it's such a interesting thing to think about because that constraint of you having low resources at the end of the day, it helped you get something out and it helped you yeah. create something that was valuable with those within the constraint that you had. And maybe yeah. if you spent more time and more energy and more effort on it, who knows where it would have gotten, right? It's uh, in this land yeah. of um, an alternate reality that we never get to live. <laughs> so yeah, I think, I think I asked one of the senior engineers once, like, did we, like, I, cause I, after we built it and had been out and it was successful for a bit, I was like, did we really need to do this real time? Cause I was just thinking about it. <laughs> and he was like, he was like, no, but, but it was our decision and we got to build it and it was more fun. And I was like, that's also true. <laughs> like at the end of the day, like, you know, when you're really resource constrained and we didn't have like a lot of the, we didn't have a manager, for example, like we just had a director, we all report, everyone in my team reported directly to a director you get to choose, you get to choose essentially what you're doing. The director doesn't have time to like tell you what to do. Um, and as an engineer, you kind of get to choose what's like most fun. As long as it's not like getting in the way of your deliverables, like it, you can choose the thing that is like most interesting for you. And that's kind of how we did it here. Yeah. So I've got one last question for you before we wrap this up. And mm -hmm. We used to call these war stories, but considering the current events that are happening so close to my door, uh, yeah. we're going to rebrand them as ML Oops. Do you okay. have any, uh, any ML Oops stories or what was your, what's one that jumps to mind? I'm not, because I, every engineer has a story. Uh, so what is one that you automatically think about when I say ML Oops and uh, how can we learn from that? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I've definitely pushed like bugs that, that have crazy <laughs> impacts and like bring down the whole system. Um, I've done that. I'm sure I did that. I didn't do it too much at Uber, surprisingly, actually. Like, I think I only did it maybe like once or twice. Um, but, uh, I, I once pushed a bug in Amazon that like paged everyone in the org and that like was really, <laughs> uh, really really sad what what the lessons learned there is just uh, it's usually the same thing which is like uh how did we miss this in like the code review what were the issues like did we not have the right context were the not right reviewers not on it could i have done more due diligence could we have set up better alerting or monitoring or tests why didn't we have a test to capture that specific thing um i find honestly the majority of these things in my experience come from me personally not having the context or like the understanding of the system and I think probably one of the reasons why it had, didn't happen to me much at Uber is because I built the thing from scratch. So like I knew mm. exactly how it worked, like from the ins and outs. And mm. typically most of my oops were actually like infrastructure issues, not things that I, that I did. Um, so I think that's kind of interesting. Whereas like when I think back of all the, all my oops mistakes in the past, it usually came from some fundamental misunderstanding of how the system operated. And so my change would break something. Brilliant. Well, thanks okay. so much for coming on here, man. And everyone listening, check out this guy's band. Check out the uh, new system design review animation video that we put out. And of course, read the original blog post. And um, yeah, if somebody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to get a hold of you, Jacob? Um, you can hit my email. It's uh, tsafman at gmail.com or I'm on like Twitter. And I think that's about it. I don't really use Personally, I don't use anything. You can hit my band up. My band is on everything. Spotify, yeah. Should, yeah, yeah. yeah, send the Spotify link. That's, that's it. That's yeah. what you ask. I'm not personally very active on social media, but my band is. So you can hit up Good Kid Good kid Band on, on everything. There we go. Awesome. Thanks again, man. Yeah, no problem. It was a pleasure. <laughs>